in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, peace be upon you. Welcome to another episode of From the Desk of Kamdi. Our series of dialogues continues in the 23 question series and today marks the commencement of the 132nd episode. What is Sunnah? We are exploring this question today. This session, the 17th on this subject, delves deeper. Let's start. Kamdi Sahab, thank you immensely for your time. What exactly is Sunnah and why do we discuss it? Over the course of 16 sessions, your responses to these questions have been elucidated. What do you perceive Sunnah to be and what constitutes its essence? Apart from the Quran, another source of knowledge through which the religion's guidance was imparted consists of what has been called the perpetual adherence and the unified scholarly consensus of the Muslim community. Ghamdi Sahab has elucidated what figures like Imam Shafi'i and Ibn Hazam have articulated. Similarly, the perspectives of Imam Saraksi and Shah Waliullah were discussed. Ghamdi Sahab, we've also reviewed your list of sunnas and having applied diverse principles, we also saw this resulting in a robust and coherent framework of thought regarding the sunnah spanning from foundational principles to their derivatives, which is manifesting consistency throughout. The question I wish to respectfully pose is, why is this topic under discussion? Please enlighten us. When the matter appears so straightforward and uncomplicated, what exactly is the contention between you and the scholars? If it's asserted that there exists a fundamental disagreement, in reality, there is none. The contention merely revolves around a particular term or its application. All right. All that has been attributed to the Prophet, peace be upon him, I categorize as distinct and unique directives of the religion issued by the Prophet himself and propose that the term Sunnah should exclusively pertain to these. Besides these, the exemplary model, understanding and explication, and similar isolated narrations should be identified by their specific names or categorized accordingly rather than being labeled as Sunnah. This is akin to our references to the Quran, the Holy Book. Numerous interpretations have been provided by the Prophet, peace be upon him, along with contributions from his companions. Our scholars have also penned interpretations. Should someone apply the term Quran to both these aspects, I would respectfully argue that the application of the term Quran should be confined solely to the divine revelation and should not extend to its interpretations or explanations. Essentially, this encapsulates the disagreement. Therefore, Back in 2009, when numerous esteemed scholars voiced their concerns regarding this issue, I responded through my writings. This response was published in my book, Makamat, in 2009. Herein, I detailed the same arguments and am presenting an excerpt from it to you now. Yes, sir. I noted, the Prophet, peace be upon him, has presented the Quran to humanity. Besides the Quran, within the realm of religion, he has introduced three core elements. These are distinct, unique directives and guidance that do not derive from the Quran. This is the core issue. That is, these guidances and directives are inherently autonomous, originating directly from the Messenger of God. Peace be upon him. These were imparted by the Prophet. Peace be upon him. Furthermore, the clarifications and detailed explanations of these directives, whether they relate to the Quran or are external to it. Just as the Prophet, his companions and scholars have offered their elucidations, similar detailed explanations by the Prophet, peace be upon him, have also been transmitted as solitary reports. These teachings and directives, whether they stem from the Quran, the Sunnah, or are inherently autonomous, thus serve as models for practice. These three components are what I have discussed. Our scholars have traditionally applied the term Sunnah uniformly across all three. That is, to the autonomous guidances and directives, to the exemplary model, and to understanding and explication. Our scholars apply the term Sunnah to all these three, which I consider inappropriate. In my view, the term Sunnah should be reserved for the first category, namely, the autonomous directives and guidance. In my opinion, the term Sunnah should apply primarily to the first category, understanding and explication to the second, an exemplary model to the third. Why must we do so? The purpose behind this distinction is, 
Its aim is to eliminate the confusion caused by grouping fundamental and derivative concepts under the same label. Thus, when the same term is applied to both the principle and its derivatives, it becomes challenging for people to differentiate between them. They struggle to discern their statuses, their nature, and their respective importance. And when something foundational to the religion and something a scholar may declare decades later or even until the end of times are placed on the same level, highlighting this, I have previously attempted to clarify what exactly is the basis of our disagreement. The disagreement pertains to the use of a term or its application. My stance is that the term sunnah should be reserved exclusively for those directives and prohibitions that are autonomous and have been directly issued by the Prophet, peace be upon him, whether they be his sayings, actions, or advisory teachings. For all other aspects, the terms used should accurately reflect their true nature, that is, understanding and explication for interpretations and detailed explanations. Exemplary model for the practical model set by the Prophet, as I mentioned earlier, I reserve the term for those autonomous directives, and here's why I do so, to illustrate that the seven principles have been outlined in my book. We have previously elaborated on each of these. The intent here is to explain why should this term not apply to these aspects. A significant segment of our scholars have even gone further, applying the term sunnah not just to understanding and explication or exemplary model, but also to the sirah and biographical information as well. It is imperative to differentiate these categories not only for a deeper understanding of the religion, but also to preserve the distinguished status of Sunnah in the future. Like the Quran, it too is an established source of the religion. Thus, our scholars also perceive that the difference lies in the distinction between a foundational principle and its derivative. Understood. They recognize this. Consequently, their adopted methodology is that although they use the same term, that is, sunnah for autonomous directives, sunnah for exemplary model, and sunnah for understanding and explication as well. Some even extend the term sunnah to include sirah and biographical narratives. Using the same term, they then realize that this places the foundational and the derivative on the same level, prompting them to categorize it into two types. That is, what do they propose? They assert that the religion of God has been transmitted through the Book of God and through the Sunnah, which comprises two types. That is, there are two types of Sunnah. What necessitated this classification? The reason is that the original and its derivative cannot be equated. Both these elements, that is, the Sunnah and its associated concepts, if regarded as distinct, then it's clear that they were not conveyed through a single source. Their means of transmission differ. And their origins vary as well? And indeed, their very natures are distinctly different. Thus, allow me to present their perspective. This is Ibn Abdelbar, a celebrated scholar, well known to anyone familiar with the intellectual tradition of Muslims. His book, Ja'amu Bayanil Ilm, is quite renowned. Here, I read a passage from it. He addresses the foundational sources of knowledge, that is, what constitutes the primary sources of religion. He states, Wa amma usulul ilm fal kitab was sunnah, that is, what are the principal sources of knowledge in religion? Two things, the Book of God, the Quran, and the Sunnah. As you've mentioned, this is the same thing we've been discussing. He then adds, Watankasimu sunnah to kismain, meaning sunnah is divided into two types. That is, sunnah is categorized into two types. The book has only one type. The Quran, the book of God, does not have two forms. That is not one Quran that you and I have and another of a different kind. No. However, he states that sunnah is of two types. Ahaduhuma, which is the first one. Tankuluhul kafatu anil kafa. The first type is that which the entire community of Muslims transmits from one generation to the next. This aligns with what we've said before. That is, the entire group of companions transmitted it unanimously, followed by those who came after, and then the generation after. And even today, 
it is received through the consensus of the Muslim community. The terms used here, Naklul Kafa and Il Kafa, have been thoroughly discussed by us. He explains that this is the first category. Now consider the second type, Wa Zarbus Sani Minas Sunna. The second category of Sunnah is Akbarul Ahadis Sikat al Asbat al Udur, that is, the isolated reports from reliable, truthful, and upright individuals. This forms the second category. He makes a clear distinction between the two. Regarding the latter, I've previously mentioned, it's inappropriate to label it as Sunnah, as I've explained before. This mix up confuses the fundamental with the derivative. Therefore, everything that falls under this category, that is, whatever is received through isolated reports, whether it's understanding and explication, exemplary model, or biographical narratives, they should be identified by their specific names and classified under those categories, and it's unsuitable to apply the term Sunnah to them. This encapsulates the disagreement. Ramdi Sahab, you've elucidated the distinction and you've clearly referenced his book showing that whatever you've stated about Sunnah thus far is completely aligned with the scholars, yet you diverge on what the scholars propose. The nature of this discrepancy has been detailed by you. You've just highlighted that the term Sunnah is wholly inappropriate for these aspects, a point you've also made in the second principle of your book. The term Sunnah negates the notion that elements of faith, imaniyat, should be applied to it. It's often argued that the term itself provides a scope. I'm about to quote from Lisanul Arab by Ibn Manzur, who notes that the lexical definition of Sunnah refers to a method or practice. Is there room within the term scope to encompass these elements? Given the confusion it generates, you recommend that it's better to separate them or from the term standpoint, as you assert that Sunnah signifies a method or practice and there's no room for these elements within it? There are two approaches concerning the term. One approach keeps the term within its defined scope and utilizes it accordingly. The other approach acknowledges that the term was initially used in a specific manner, which we have expanded in our usage. Both possibilities exist. It's not to say that extending a term beyond its original lexical scope will constitute a calamity. This happens with many terms. I've argued that not only should the term be confined within its boundaries, it's essential, moreover, to avoid conflating the original with its derivative under a single label, as this would compromise the integrity of both and lead to confusion. Therefore, this practice should be avoided. Clearly, the point is understood. Let's proceed with our discussion, Khamdi Sahab, addressing the second critical question arising from your comprehensive exposition. The nature of the Quran has been definitively established by Sharia, namely, that the Quran constitutes a specific text. Similarly, Sunnah is also a term defined by Sharia. When a term is designated by Sharia and you acknowledge that the complete content has been transmitted through consensus and practical adherence, then the Muslim community's consensus adopts a distinct stance regarding this term's definition, encompassing biography, exemplary model, understanding and explication. It could be questioned whether you are redefining this term and altering its established terminology. What the entire Muslim community has recognized and defined through consensus or how they have understood this term appears to diverge from your perspective. This is not how the issue at hand is at all. The term Sunnah has been integral to the discourse of the Prophet, peace be upon him. It has also been employed in the sayings of his companions. The term has been used to denote method and to describe directives among various other applications and to such an extent that in the Quran it is used to describe God's practice as he interacts with his creation and for this the Quran employs the term sunnatullah or practices of God. This demonstrates the term's usage, the directives and guidance that are fundamentally autonomous provided by the Prophet peace be upon him did not specify any particular term to be used for them. The scholars chose this term, considering the vocabulary employed by the Prophet, peace be upon him, this term was selected. The term Sunnah was thus derived from there, yet its transformation into a formal term was the endeavor of the scholars. When the scholars established it as a term, it was not universally accepted. Experts in various fields employ it in markedly different contexts. 
I will present all these viewpoints to you and illustrate whether it was a legal term that I altered. No, a legal term is one established by the Prophet. Here, the term was adopted from the sacred tongue of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the scholars have subsequently fashioned it into a term. Thus, they are responsible for its definition. When scholars define something or establish its boundaries, since they are not prophets, both you and I may disagree with them. Therefore, it's essential first to ascertain whether there was unanimous agreement among them. This is not the case. Initially, I will introduce you to the views of Amidi from his work Al-Ihkam Fi Usulil Ahkam. You are aware of Amidi's prominence in this field. He dedicates a chapter to Sunnah and provides its definition. Listen carefully. He initially clarifies the meaning attributed to the term Sunnah. He echoes the sentiment, stating in legal terminology it signifies expression of the method. That is, Sunnah refers to the method. He continues, فَقَدْ تُطْلَقُوا عَلَى مَا كَانَ مِنَ الْإِبَادَةِ نَافِلَةً مَنْكُلَهْ أَنِينْ نَبِي صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ And in terms of Sharia, in what context is it utilized within Sharia? He states, it occasionally applies to acts of worship, nafilatam mankulatan anin nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sometimes it is used to refer to voluntary acts of worship, which, though not obligatory, are transmitted from the Prophet, peace be upon him, emphasizing their importance or exalted status. This aligns with what you've outlined in your criteria for determining sunnah. Exactly. An example would be the obligatory prayers in Salah, which are recognized as Sunnah and confirmed as such. However, we do not label them as Sunnah. The voluntary prayers that follow, for which we have received traditions attributed to the Prophet, peace be upon him, are often referred to as, I am about to perform Sunnah. So he specifies that this is one application of Sunnah. فَقَدْ تُطْلَقُوا عَلَى مَا كَانَ مِنَ الْعِبَدَاتِ نَافِلَةً مَنْكُلَهْ أَنِ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ Thus, it is occasionally applied to voluntary acts of worship attributed to the Prophet, peace be upon him. He then elaborates, وَقَدْ تُطْلَقُوا عَلَى مَا صَدَارَ أَنِ الرَّسُولِ مِنَ الْعَدِلَاتِ شْرَيَا مِمَّا لَيْسَ بِمَطْلُوف That is, actions that form part of Sharia evidence issued by the Prophet, peace be upon him, yet are not directly derived from the Qur'an. Observe that he offers another definition. Scholars present this definition variably. I've now shown you how a prominent scholar defines it. Now let's expand our view to other definitions, or how other scholars characterize it. I am citing from Al-Hadis wal-Muhaddisun. He notes, the scholars of Usul the very group whose definition I've mentioned are specialists in foundational Islamic knowledge. فَأُلَمَاؤُ الْأُسُولِ يُطْلِقُنَا لَفْزَسْ سُنَّةِ عَلَىٰ أَقْوَالِ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ وَآفَالِهِ وَتَقْرِرَاتِهِ The scholars of Usul apply the term sunnah to the sayings of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, his actions and his tacit approvals. This clarifies from the outset, that is, different scholars across various fields perceive it differently. Scholars of Usul apply Sunnah to the Prophet's sayings, his actions, and to matters he validated. He does not restrict its application to sayings or actions linked to Sharia evidence. That is, the Prophet's sayings might address traditional practices among Arabs or even his personal matters. Thus, he Understood. provides this definition without specifying those details. He adds further insight, وَبَعَزُ الْأُسُولِيِّنْ يُطْلِقُ لَفْزَ السُنَّةِ عَلَى مَا آمِلَ عَلَيْهِ أَصْحَابُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ And some Usuli scholars extend the term Sunnah to include practices of the Prophet's companions. They go further. Moving beyond, some scholars of foundational knowledge apply Sunnah to the companions' actions as well. Intriguing. He continues, stating that fiqh scholars, وَأُلْمَاءُ الْفِقْ يُرِيدُنَا بِالسُنَّةِ and the scholars of fiqh define sunnah as the established method followed in the religion that is neither obligatory nor essential. This is akin to what we saw with Amidi, 
indicating Sunnah is applied to voluntary acts of worship transmitted from the Prophet, peace be upon him. Thus, its usage within fiqh varies significantly. Continuing, and scholars involved in preaching and guidance, that is, those focused on preaching and guiding the community, define Sunnah as everything that opposes innovation. This illustrates the depth of his insight. He provides an example, he says, Fa yuqal in dahum fulanun ala sunnah. When it is said among them that such and such person follows sunnah, so when is it said, Iza amila ala wafqi ma amila alayhi nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam? When he is acting in accordance with the deeds of the Prophet, peace be upon him, sawa an kana zalika mimma nusa alayhi fil kitabil aziz amla, regardless of whether it's based on Quranic directives or those of the Prophet. In contexts of preaching and advising, when encouraging people to adopt correct practices or to follow the proper ways, it is often said they should adhere to the sunnah and avoid innovation. Thus, here the term is used quite differently. And now, consider his conclusion, wa ulama ul hadith, and the scholars of hadith, yuri iduna bis sunnah. How do hadith scholars use the term sunnah? He clarifies, alama zahaba ilahi jumhuruhum. According to the majority of them, not all but the majority, aqwalan nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it refers to the sayings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, listen further, wa afa'alahu, the deeds of the Prophet, peace be upon him, without any terms and conditions, wa taqriratihi. That is, the Prophet, peace be upon him, was good-looking, had long hair. The things which were confirmed by the Prophet, peace be upon him, wa sifatihi al it goes to the extent that the innate qualities of the Prophet, peace be upon him, are called sunnah. The hair of the Prophet, peace be upon him, were such, the face was such, and such was his style of walking, even those are termed the sunnah, wal kulukiyah, and the aspects of character and lifestyle. That is, the Prophet, peace be upon him, was truthful, was a mean, trustworthy, that too is termed sunnah, wa sirahu, and would apply the word sunnah on the incidents of his life too. Wa Magazia, the battles fought by the Prophet, their description would also be applied with the word Sunnah. Wa Baza Akbarihi Qabl al Besa, this was during prophethood, the things which happened to the Prophet, peace be upon him, before his prophethood, those two are seen as Sunnah. He has given its example too. He says, Misla Tahanusihi fi Kharihira, like the Prophet, peace be upon him used to go to the cave of Hira before prophethood. When something would be described about it, that too would be called the Sunnah. That is, this expansive view is there in the use of this word among the Ahle Hadith. He says that all this was fine. They apply the word Sunnah on things like wa misla annahu kana ummiyan la yaqraw ala yuktub. That is, the Prophet, peace be upon him, was an ummi and he didn't know how to read and write. He offers this among other examples. While I've highlighted some key examples here, there are numerous others demonstrating the breadth of usage of this term among the scholars of Hadith. After presenting these, who is knowledgeable or familiar with the scholarly tradition can assert that I have altered its Sharia-defined meaning? It is a term employed by scholars with various implications. Different scholars utilize this term according to their specific areas of expertise and knowledge. I have also outlined my perspective, supported by reasons and evidence, and I have defined the seven principles ensuring that the term is employed within these defined boundaries. Gamdi Sahab, what distinguishes your view from that of other scholars regarding the identification of Sunnah? The clarification is thorough, and it's clear where you stand on the points of contention. Why do you restrict Sunnah to specific independent religious and practical directives of the religion that have reached the Muslim community through consensus and continuous transmission? Ghamdi Sahab, having clarified all these points, the criticisms and doubts cast by the scholarly community, we will address them one by one. Unfortunately, we are out of time today. 
We will resume our discussion in the next session. Thank you very much for your time so far.